I approached Narala Norasik the Gatekeeper, a fictional work of Singapore literature published in 2016, through the analytic of Irigaray and Alterity, as established due to Irigaray's This Sex Which Is Not One, especially Kosifan Tutti, in which it is established that Felicism compensates for its discursive crisis, sustaining itself upon the other, nourishing itself with the other, desiring itself through the other, even without ever relating to it as such. That is, within the discursive crisis of the ethics of representation, which is to Irigaray a discursive machinery, the ethical impulse to adopt a feminist politics in producing representations of the feminine may, while revealing, still reproduce the gendered problematics of masculinist hegemony. Despite the efforts to undermine the overriding patriarchal system, feminist politics within the novel are ultimately problematic. Firstly, the only way for a woman to resist her own subjection to what Laura Malvey calls androcentric schizophrenia is to appropriate it, and even then, she cannot truly transcend it. There is a feminist effort to realize the language of the semiotic, a feminine language derived from the pre edible period of fusion between mother and child. This is done through the inclusion of Tuyunri, which is, and I quote, a language that is deeply matriarchal. However, this effort is undercut by the realm of shared cultural meaning that is patriarchal society, in which, as Bridget Chippers observes, order of law, meaning, and structure prevails. The presentation of the underground city of Nauruit as the space of the abject. Barbara Cree defines as that which threatens to destroy life, but also helps to define life, such that it becomes, as Christia Vell points out, the place where meaning collapses, is also problematic in how it conforms to, and it so reproduces, even while revealing, conventional patterns of phallococentrism, which configure logic and meaning around the symbolic fairness. Rhea, the gatekeeper's protagonist, is, quote, a natura, a snake woman, or in other words, a medusa, the tutorial language of the, la the world of Manticura, presented within the novel. She is a hybrid, both physically and within the configurations of psychic possibility instantiated by Homi K. Baba's hybridity and colonial ambivalence. The figure of the Medusa is a powerful symbol of feminist resistance. She is the woman whose gaze wields power enough to trump even that of the male gaze. Thus, she may resist this androcentric gaze of scopophilia, which, as Malvi puts, subjects the female to the male's controlling and curious gaze. The successful appropriation of the power of the gaze by the female in Christella's writing disturbs identity, system, order, and so threatens established patriarchal strictures. The feminist politics of the novel may at first be located in this figure of the Medusa, a powerful symbol of feminist resistance. She is the woman who appropriates the power of the gaze so successfully as to triumph even over men who epitomize patriarchal supremacy, the alpha male figure of militant patriarchy, soldiers. In a head-on confrontation between Rhea and the soldier, he, and I quote, stared at her down his sight attempting to subdue her using the power of his gaze to take aim and fire a well-placed shot to overcome her, the Medusa, the female monster. However, the power of her gaze surpassed his, being, quote, enough to cover the distance between them within the milliseconds it took uh, for him to start curving his finger around the trigger. She was thus able to resist his subjection at the receiving end of a symbol of penetrating male power, the bullet of a militaristic gun, Beyond resisting her own subjection, the Medusa is, having appropriated the power, of, the power of the gaze, further able to threaten patriarchal strictures of institutionalized sexism. Petrification is so formidable that any man would be, quote, all gone with one look. One look, and government officials too. Her power is thus capable of surmounting even that of the state and its agents, thereby posing a real threat to the established systems of order instituted in patriarchal society. In appropriating the male gaze, she disrespects, as Christopher writes, borders, positions, rules, because she appropriates as well the position of the male, the looker, and abdicates the position of the female, the looked at. Her position and power proves a greater menace and its potential to transgress and overturn the established norms of patriarchy. The power of petrification subjugates male bodies, thereby inverting the norms of sexual power, as the male is now dominated by the female instead. All her statues were of female of, were of soldier folk, and almost every one of them had been ravaged by either carving tools or paint. However, it is then problematic that in her subjection of the male body to her control, she feminizes the male body. One of her statues, quote, was of a man with raised arms broken off at the elbows. His entire chest area was carved out into the crude beginnings of breasts, mounds rough but unmistakable. This suggests that the primary way for the female to effectively resist the male gaze is to appropriate it and to so subject another female to it. Through this presentation, it becomes then the natural condition of the female body to be subjugated and controlled. Where there is a dearth of other females to subjugate, the solution sought is to create one through the feminization of the male body. 
This presents a problematic mode of feminist resistance to colonial mimicry, for it is only through the appropriation of male power that the female can effectively resist subjugation by the male. Suggesting that power is implicated with being male, that power is essentially bound up with masculinity. And in rigorous terms, to return to that repressed entity, the female imaginary, is to reject the presumably male imaginaries imagining that the yaki and telos of woman is a condition of penis envy, the desire to appropriate for oneself the genital organ that has a cultural monopoly and value. The penis is the symbolic phallus that men have, and since women cannot possess it, she can only seek to find equivalents for it. It's represented in the gatekeeper as the power to penetrate. This undercuts the extent to which the figure of the Medusa may be taken as an empowering feminist symbol. It is furthermore doubtful whether even such a woman who so successfully appropriates the male gaze ultimately resisted enough to transcend it herself. Rhea remains subject to the sexualizing power of the male gaze in the novel, where the third person narration is focalized through Edric, who conceives of her in terms of her body, where he chooses to remember, quote, only the best of her. His mental image of her clearly reflects how he subjects her to his male gaze, conceiving of her as a body fit for sexualization. I quote, He could smell the salty musk of the valley between her breasts, the fullness of them in his hands, the valley that began the invisible line down to her stomach, the puget triangle wedged between warm thighs. She thus becomes, as Malvi opined, a perfect product, whose body, stylized and fragmented by close-ups, is the content of the narrative and the direct recipient of the look. The female body therefore remains a sight, subject to the male gaze, for the inscription of male sexual meaning and power. The scene in which Rhea and Edrix engage in sexual intercourse only further reifies male sexual dominance as of the female body by skirting around the issues of consent. Conspicuous narrative lacuna results instead in presenting a situation of dubious consent. In fact, the ending of the novel problematizes its feminist politics as the woman's potential is ultimately co-opted and weaponized by the state to further and serve its own ends. In her captivity, the role of gatekeeper is forced upon Rhea, an imprisoner who manages to kill her will be pardoned of his crimes. Her agency is therefore usurped, whatever agency she has is only permitted by the state, which possesses her now. Her powers are not hers to control, but are manipulated by the state as a means of ridding the state of undesirables. The state objectifies her as, quote, no more than a severed head stuck upon the shield that the nation state sought to build, shielding its own interests by weaponizing the woman's potential. Rhea is reduced to purely an instrumental function in service to the masculinist, dispossessing state institution of jail. Like the mythological Medusa's head, weaponized by Perseus, as Irigori writes, the male subject only enjoys the monstrous feminine body after having chopped it up, dressed it, disguised it, mortified it in his fantasies, and repurposed her for her himself. If the figure of the Medusa does not stand up to the scrutiny for a successful feminist effort within the novel, perhaps then the reinscribing of her identity as a Madura in the Tayuri language intimates towards the next feminist impulse worth considering. The notion of language as a preserve of the symbolic would be undercut by realizing the language of the semiotic as a feminist alternative to established structured language. Tuyunri realizes such a language that is deeply matriarchal. It has many words for the social roles of females, quote, Naruk, aunt, Naruk, shortened forms of aunt usually used to address a significantly older woman, Tura, woman, but only one for the social role of males, quote, Isuk, uncle or father, the only existing word in the Tuyunri lexicon. It can be used to address an older man or the father of a child. As languages reflect the speaker's cultural realities, the role of the male must not have been as prominent in Tuyunri society, such that there was no need to develop the vocabulary to refer to males using a range of reference. Moreover, Tuyunri is well placed to assume the role of the language of the semiotic. It is, I quote, an old forgotten language, the one spoken before writing. Just as the semiotic is conceived of by shippers, as pre-verbal modes of communication. Tyranry is imprecise, quote, often running around in circles, around things, depending a lot on the context of the moment, and privileges prosody, being very rich in sounds, rather than semantics, just as the semiotic dwells in the fissures and prosody of language, rather than in the denotative meanings of words. And to Yunri's, quote, not being given time to evolve, this suggests that the language was, in psychoanalytic terms, only present in the early pre stage, the period of fusion between mother and child. Following the child's transition 
uh, to the symbolic realm encoded in established structured language that defies the semiotic. This language was then discarded, discarded and so was never carried forth by the child into his development. Since the child then became inducted into the symbolic realm, there was no longer any need for the semiotic language. It thus became, quote, a language no one had used for anymore, just less two new years. However, as mentioned above, this female semiotic is eventually scribed over by the male symbolic and so falls short of presenting a successful feminist effort. To the mise en beam frame narrative of Ria's capture, it may be seen that Ria's narration is being scribed over into existence by her captors, who are agents of the symbolic, and so the symbolic scribes over the semiotic. This comes across most clearly in the confusion caused by the misrendering of the Matura, snake woman, as Matura, which means storyteller or inscriber instead. Throughout the narrative, the gendered spaces of language are thus made patent, Woman, the storyteller, and her oral traditions agitate desperately, feebly, and transiently against man, the inscriber, and his written script. Even where Ria, who, knew, who knows Tujinri, and is the focalizer of the narration, the narration renders her as a metura, storyteller, instead of a metura, snake woman, in her own consciousness. Quote, Ria had gone to his house that very same day, and her arrival was met by a frantic mother hustling her sons about to make them presentable to the Matthew uh, storyteller. In irregular terms, take that to mean that woman does not exist, but that language exists. That woman does not exist owing to the fact that language, a language, rules as master and that she threatens as a sort of pre-discursive reality to disrupt its order. And Rhea, whose body is social text, cannot exist in the masculinist hegemonic reality with her narrative as discursive text. Now circumscribed and circulated by the male subject, otherwise, it would mean granting that there may be some other logic and one that upsets its own, that is, a logic that challenges mastery in Irigurian terms. In this way then, as Irigurian says, are we not brought back to the traditional division between the intelligible and the perceptible? The fact that the perceptible may even turn out in the end to be written with a capital letter marks its subordination to the intelligible order to the intelligible, moreover, as a place of inscription of forms. The misrendering of Matura as Matura occurs as a result of the semiotic being imposed upon by the symbolic, and so forced to conform to the symbolic standards of codification such that Ria's story may be recorded. The symbolic's focus is, notably, uh, quote, to tell, no, create a story like hers, and so the male symbolic inscribes over the female semiotic in an act not merely of narrative reproduction, but of narrative creation. The narrative recounted does not just reproduce the female's narrative, but in fact depart from nuances in the female's narrative. In feminist politics, the novel are thus problematized in its presentation. Uh, furthermore, as the underground city of Narut as the space of the abject. In fact, Narut seems structured specifically as the space of the maternal abject from descriptions of its physical geography, this intricate complex of tunnels radiating from a cavernous hollow we call the womb. Uh, firstly, quote, one could not think of Nauru apart from its vast networks of tunnels and corridors, its corners, and still more tunnels of uneven turning paths and what seemed to be a massive labyrinth. Just as the womb is the site whence menstrual blood originates, Nauru is the site whence worship of the deity, the blood mother or blood aunt, an ancient religion which is believed Hope believes that the constant cycle of rebirth, reminiscent of monthly menstrual blood cycles, uh, originated. The way in which menstruation doubles as both the waste that is ejected from the body and which holds the potential for life is also re reflected in their root. Quote, Without a sophisticated sewage disposal system, it had adopted a smell. It was the smell of wasting and waste, but it was the smell of living too. Thus, Narut presents, as Creed writes of the abject, that which threatens to destroy life, but also helps to define life, such that apart from it, one would feel a strange sense of incompleteness. As the novel itself writes, the reassurance, then, of the living is founded in the knowledge that the living is not the waste or the wasting, though it is precisely such waste and wasting that constantly threatens the assurance of the living by highlighting life's fragility and constant ebbing away unto death. In this way, Narut as the place, quote, where jungle met rock, where no one dared to go to, becomes Kristeva's place where meaning collapses, thereby threatening the normality of society. However, the threat of this space of the abject to the normality is addressed by othering this space in ways that conform to and so reproduce conventional patterns of phallocentrism, which configure logic and meaning around the symbolic fallacy. 
Now root is delineated against and so set up as a shadow double to the surface world of metropolitan Manticura. It is, quote, a dark and putrid underworld where the laws of the surface did not apply. Now root's meaning problematically remains often non-autonomous, defined not independently, but in relation to how it departs from the stable reality of Manticura up above. Also, this feminine space is problematically centered around a symbol of patrilineal tradition. At the literal center of Nya Root is Old Waro's shop, which, quote, had stood at the center of concentric circles of houses and tenement apartments for as long as anyone could remember, making one wonder if the settlement had been built around it instead of being a product of the settlement's need for provisions. The space of Nya Root is then symbolically configured around this symbol of patrilineal tradition as Waro's father, quote, used to own the store and had later relinquished it to Waro, passing it down to Waro through structures of patrilineal inheritance. This fittingly adheres to a rigorous phallic model that shares the values promulgated by patriarchal society and culture, values inscribed in the philosophical corpus, property, production, order, form, unity, visibility, and erection. In fact, Waro himself is also such an agent of patriarchy. He would give uh, the young women all sorts of trouble with his salacious remarks, sometimes with brazen bum grabbing, and not even the threat of petrification was able to keep him in check. Hence, in the presentation of Naruto as space of the maternal abject, conventional patterns of phallocentrism, which configure logic and meaning around the symbolic phallus, are conformed to and so reproduced. In conclusion, then, for the feminist project to develop unequivocally effective and successful modes of feminist representation and resistance in literature remains. Hidden away, hidden away, perhaps, in the cracks and crevices of chasms like Nya Root and the generative maternal womb. The creation must be an act expressive of the power of autonomy. The uncreated makes no demands on the creator to be created. It cannot. If the creator makes a choice, and so calling it into creation with hospitality, or risks instead the hostility of biopolitical implantation trauma, to irrigory, the womb as receptacle, receives the marks of everything, understands and includes everything except itself. But its relation to the intelligible is never actually established. The, rest, the receptacle can re reproduce everything, mine everything except itself. It is the womb of mimicry. Thank you.